This is a market right now that is likely going to take a breather today, but it's been a dazzling start to the fourth quarter. It's a seasonably strong time of the market. Should investors be optimistic this Q4? I think it's hard to be, quite honestly. I mean, you could certainly see a bear market rally here, just like we saw over the summer. Um, they're common. That's sort of the, the rule rather than the exception. But I'm trying to look at some things under the surface to give myself some clues as to whether the, the bottom is enduring. Uh, and certainly we've seen what appears to be like momentum uh, Monday, yesterday. But actually looking under the surface from a technical perspective, I'm a little bit concerned that we're not seeing that typical momentum spark we see off durable market lows. Uh, one example the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 making two standard deviation advances in any single day. Usually off of these big bottoms, we see 50, 60, 70 percent of names doing that. We've seen 10, 20 percent of names doing that. So you're not seeing that thrust off the bottom that we usually see. So definitely looking at other things. But in terms of what the market is telling me, I think that's one good clue. You know, it's interesting, Jay, that, that, that Jeff mentions that uh, there was a, an interesting tweet from Ryan Dietrich, uh, you know, who watches the market a lot from a, a market technician standpoint, saying that the 5.7 percent start to Q4 2022 after two days is the best start to a new quarter since the second quarter of 1938. 1938, the best start to a Q4 here for the S&P. This is something now where investors are maybe grappling with this idea that there's more downside to come, but you can't ignore what just happened in the last two days, can you? No. Although, it's a, as you pointed out, it's a huge move in a couple of days. We would, not to get too short-term oriented, think that we're going to be under a little bit of pressure over the next few days because think about all the data. It's all labor-related. And we have a very, very strong labor market because we're coming out of a pandemic. So that's likely to pressure rates and be a short-term negative. But we're quite constructive, not bullish, but constructive about the market, not because of technicals, but fundamentals. Next Wednesday starts earnings season, PPI is reported, which could be positive, maybe not yet. And then also our bull thesis is that the Fed's ultra hawkish uh, policy is melting down Europe, which they're going to be slow to perceive. It's almost like their third mandate is to be behind the curve. But you're seeing financial crises emerge and then very weak PMIs. So if Europe melts down, that takes pressure off interest rates, inflation, and allows the Fed to be less hawkish. Okay, so, so that's the pivot argument, right? And, and maybe, Jeff, I, I'll turn to you for this one here because Jay brings up an interesting point. A, a lot of folks I spoke to and a lot of folks out there are saying that, that the market rally, the, the pullback in interest rates is now kind of pricing in this so-called Fed pivot, that they're going to be a little more dovish in the coming months, quarters, and years, that, the, that interest rates may not rise so quickly, that the terminal rate may not be as high as we thought it was going to be. Where exactly did that narrative even come from, given the fact that we don't have that much data supporting a big drop in inflationary pressure? Or maybe it was the jolts data from yesterday that showed job openings had been fallen by the biggest pace since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, and some of the early PMI readings, the prices paid was a little bit lower. There was some dovish surprise from some global central banks. So I think that sort of sparked it. But my guess is, in, in talking about the tighter labor market, so you're seeing some good signs relative to what the Fed is looking for. So 1.8 million job openings have come off the table. So that's what the Fed wants to do first. They want to destroy the job openings. Um, so that's good. But look at the quit rate, for example, still extremely low. So they're going to be looking at that sort of tightness. Uh, and you need to see some of that come off before wage growth slows. And that's really the key to inflation. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's the pivot narrative that's driving this. I mean, look at what was up huge yesterday. It was ARC up over six and a half percent. It was these high beta names, people sort of piling in speculatively, thinking rates might drop. Um, but even if you get a little bit of a pause or just a slower pace of heightening, uh, tightening, I just think there, there's too much to contend with here. PMIs are still dropping. Uh, the Fed is still going to keep rates high for a while. And, and my guess is this sort of earnings growth slowdown that we've been speculating about, it's here now. It's not all bad, but Nike, Micron, Meta, CarMax, a lot of these companies talking about a reduction in earnings expectations. Uh, so I think we're actually going to be moving into kind of a proper earnings-driven bear market. All right. So if that's the case, uh, Jay, what are some of the top picks that you have out there? Where, where, where is it attractive to be invested? Well, we've been saying all year long to focus on dividend stocks. Um, particularly um, ones that are focused on uh, with U.S. operations. 
we think actually earnings are going to be resilient for U.S. companies, but not not so much for most internationally focused companies. So energy stocks, uh, preferred stocks are great because they're senior to common, so you have very stable dividends. Um, <clears throat> pipeline companies, utilities, these large cap dividend stocks are the places really to be. You saw Exxon uh, pre-announced positive earnings already this, this uh, quarter. So obviously energy companies are gonna have tremendous tailwinds. So those kind of old economy, non-tech, boring uh, companies that benefit from emerging from the pandemic.